Hello, my name is Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 182. How to manage a co or associate supervisor. Now this is the first vlog in what could be an incredibly long and large series. So many of you have asked me how to do something that I decided to bundle all these issues together and put them into a singular series. So I'm not quite sure how big this thing is going to get but we start with how to manage a co or associate supervisor. This comes via request of a young man who didn't want to be named and is having profound problems with his supervisors, they're basically having a scrag fight. So isn't this going incredibly well? So I will be providing some solutions for that gentleman to reboot and reorganize that relationship. But also I want to talk more overtly about co-supervision, associate supervision, and how to get it right from the very start. I'm going to also specify to you the benefits of this particular model, this way of organizing your candidature. And look, this vlog, like most of them, have has a very, very odd beginning. When I arrived at Flinders University, I was having a chat with a colleague, and I said to the gentleman, how many PhD students have you got? Obvious first question from the Dean of Graduate Research. And he said, oh look, one as a principal supervisor, but I'm a paper supervisor for five. So I found this quite unusual. When you arrive at a new institution, it's all sorts of acronyms and phrases and words that you have no idea what they mean. So I'd assume this was one of those. So I said, all right, and look, my apologies, what is a paper supervisor? And the gentleman replied, oh, look, I'm only a supervisor on paper. I just signed some forms. Okay, now I was pretty stunned by this. So if you have yourself a paper supervisor, I'm going to provide strategies for you today to change that relationship and enliven that relationship to render it meaningful. I also want to think about all the different models of co or associate supervision that are available. And I'm going to talk particularly internationally today, but also historically also historically. You see, most commonly through to the late 1980s, even really the mid-1990s, the more elite the university, the more likely you were to be supervised by a single or sole supervisor. I'll say that again. The more elite the university, the more likely you were to be supervised by a sole or single supervisor. And the statistics from that time were really clear the highest success rate, the highest completion rate, and the fastest completions occur with a sole or single supervisor. Right. Now, of course, other variables, other structures are available, particularly in the North American model with a singular advisor, with a supportive panel. But the change to the associate or co-supervisor as a model, which now is shared pretty well around the world, emerged in the late 1980s and the early 1990s in the United Kingdom and had a very interesting source. So what was happening in the late 1980s and the early 1990s is that the polytechnics were becoming new universities. So the CNAA, the Council for the National Accreditation of Awards, were responsible for ensuring that the new universities maintained the standards of the old. So yes, this is complete elitism, because trust me, there was so much innovation and interest and really high quality teaching and research in the polytechnics before we even start. So this is elitism, a lot of this is nonsense, but still, this is an important historical moment because the doctorate or indeed the PhD was where the rubber met the road uh, with, with this accreditation of the new universities to match the standards of the old. Because what happened was the old universities, the traditional universities, the elite universities wanted these new universities to work for it. They wanted them to work for the label or the standard of a university. Of course, they were relying on their own standards, supposedly being the gold standard, and making the new universities work for it. So, and we still see this to this day, the PhD is the canary in the mine. 
of quality assurance in higher education. If the standards of the PhD slip, then we know the university sector is in trouble. And by the way, this is still the case, this model of making the new universities work for it. This is still the case in North America, particularly in Canada with the new universities that emerged in the 2006 to 2008 period, particularly in Ontario and in British Columbia, guys, what happened was these new universities, the, the doctorate was withheld from them. And in many of the universities, it still is withheld from them. The old universities embedded in the legislation that they would have to agree to doctorates being offered in these new universities. Wow. Okay, so that means that the Australian higher education system is really rare because all our universities are given the self-accrediting right to offer a PhD. Okay, but anyway, as you can see, this control over PhDs was part of the fighting for it, the creation of the standard of what a university is. And part of this quality assurance was co-supervision. But let me tell you why co-supervision was implemented at this time. What would happen in the new universities is an experienced supervisor would supervise with new supervisors so they would gain on-the-job training. So this was argued that this was a way to broaden out the quality of the available supervisors. So, and of course this is important because this was the time so it's sort of changed, but not hugely, but this was the time, late 80s, early 1990s, where professional development programs for academics was not really very common, wasn't common. And also, of course, very few academics then and now hold teaching qualifications. So if you're an inverted commas new supervisor, how have you got any idea what you're doing? <laughs> how have you got any clue at all? And the accreditation, the quality assurance protocol was, all oh, right, well, the new supervisor in the new university can supervise with an older, experienced supervisor and they can learn on the job. So this is the irony of this. This co-supervision associate supervisory model was introduced for the supervisors not for the students. Is it all making sense now? Yeah. And that co-supervision, associate supervision, has now been embedded into policy and into procedure and into practice. Now, can I say of my first 20 PhD completions, 19, one nine, 19 of them were as a sole or single supervisor. So you can see I maintained that elite model through the early stages of my career. So you can see, once more, we are generalising in the 2010s. We're generalising now and we're pretending what we do now has always existed. And that's simply not the case. But what I'm going to be suggesting for you now is, OK, times have changed. The history of higher education is radically transforming and quickly. So I'm going to give you some new reasons, some important reasons that suit our context for why a co-supervisor or an associate supervisor is a really good idea and how you can manage these good ideas into an actually functioning relationship. One, supervisors leave their job, they get sick, and yes, they die. Now, once more, your old Gothic Dean starts with something terribly optimistic and buoyant. But let's get real here. Look at the generational profile of international higher education. That's a challenge. That's a problem. And we're not managing it terribly well at the moment. But further, as a workforce, international higher education is incredibly volatile. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, tenure, permanence was relatively common team. So someone would be at a university for 10, 15, 20 years, maybe their whole career. Right now, the most common contracts are two, three, and five years. So you can see the problem. You can sign on to a supervisor, and their contract can't see you to the end of your candidature. And further, of course, the volatility of international higher education, the great staff, it's incredibly competitive. We receive lots of different job offers on a daily basis, and occasionally a staff member is gonna take one of those, okay? So this is a volatile workplace for you. Therefore, it is incredibly important that your co-supervisor is not a paper supervisor, because the chances are, little bit less than 50-50, but the chances are is that co-supervisor, that paper supervisor, is going to have to take over your supervision 
for a period of time, maybe permanently or, or maybe while a permanent replacement is found, okay? Now, if they don't know what's going on, if you haven't briefed them, if you haven't kept them in the story, then that's gonna stall your thesis and your completion. So keep those co-supervisors informed of the progress. Meet with them occasionally, send them work so they know what's going on, and that's for your benefit because the volatility of international higher education means who you start with in supervision may not be who you finish with. Okay, two, inter, trans and post disciplinary theses. Now this is crucial. In these new emerging terribly exciting areas, no single supervisor is going to be able to provide all the answers and all the expertise that you're going to require. They haven't got the coverage. So the best way to receive advice in these cases is that interdisciplinary supervisory team. So different supervisors take charge of different bits of the disciplines that you are activating. So this is a model of supervision that I refer to as portfolio supervision. So you have a panel of experts in your supervisors and you deploy their expertise when required. It's almost sort of a plug in and play model of supervision. So I'm dealing with this bit of the discipline at the moment, click, okay fine, I'm dealing with this discipline now, plug in and play. That's a great model. Now this model has worked incredibly well for me. I tend to work in post-disciplinary theses. And remember I said my first 20 supervisions, 19, were sole supervision. That one other, that one that made it the 20, was a fascinating thesis on Russian television. And I was the number two, a great professor, was the uh, principal supervisor in that case. He was an expert on Russian history, Soviet history, spoke the Russian language, but they, he didn't have television. So I was the television study specialist brought in to enable that thesis. And it was a truly great experience, and the student got through in three years. Fantastic, and is in a fantastic job to this day, and is a professor. Terrific. Four, specific expertise in one area of the thesis. Now, this reason for co-supervision is different from the post or interdisciplinary thesis, but it does involve expertise. So if you're doing something that is methodologically interesting or theoretically odd and wonderful and extreme and different, then probably you're going to have to bring in an expert to manage that unusual methodology or indeed manage and have expertise in that theoretical suite. So what happens is the co-supervisor has the expertise in that method or in that theory and they come in with intensity during the period of the thesis that is the methodology work or is the theoretical shaping of the work. Now I'm doing one of these at the moment with my wonderful colleague Professor Justine Smith. Hi Justine, you are a lovely, wonderful, extraordinary human being. It's a pleasure to work with you. But Justine and I are preparing to commence with a new student. And this student is working absolutely in Justine's area, and it's completely different from my area, okay? But the student is using social media as source material in this topic, so I'll be working with the student to negotiate and understand unobtrusive research methods or non-reactive research methods, particularly regarding digital materials. So, you know, Justin obviously has incredible clinical expertise, I don't, and therefore the student will swing in, will work on that methodology with nice intensity and then move back into Justine's expertise. And we've talked about that right at the start, the student hasn't even started yet, and we've negotiated what that relationship is going to look like. So that's a great model. In comes one supervisor, works with intensity, and then moves out and only perhaps returns at the end to make sure everything is nested effectively. Okay. Five, uh, break up the boredom and freshen the candidature. This last point really does lead to the next one. The same person supervising in the same way can lead to boredom. Trust me, I supervise in the exact same way, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And so that can get a bit boring. So if you want to freshen up the thesis, a great way is to then move to the co-supervisor for a period and freshen up and enliven your relationship. And I think that's the great gift of two supervisors because you've got two different models of supervision available to you. So the candidature can be freshened up. If you get sort of a bit tired and emotional, bang, you can have that regeneration. 
and perhaps one supervisor can work with intensity, walk away, and then the alternative supervisor can work with intensity. Now that's a very successful process. Again, please agree on that at the start. Six, this is the biggie that no one talks about. Career development. Yeah, the final reason to welcome co-supervisors into your party is for career development because it's twice the networking potential, twice the publishing opportunity, and yes, most importantly, you've got yourself two referees. Right. Referees are worth their weight in gold. Please remember this. There are going to be crucial times in your life where you are desperate for a referee that you can trust and you know how they're going to behave. And by the way, if you've got supervisors that you can't trust, if you think, I don't know if they're going to write me a good reference, then for me, that's the best reason of all to actually move to a different supervisory team. People don't talk about it, but if you think, I'm not sure that person's going to write me a good reference, get yourself another supervisor who will. So most importantly, if you've got two supervisors, don't waste or minimise that opportunity. So I've given you all the reasons that you can gain from two supervisors. How do you make them play well together? Well, that's the challenge, isn't it? And it's one that personally I find incredibly difficult. The most important strategy is you must plan it out from the start. Justine and I have done this, it's working fantastically. Plan it out from the start. Print out Flinders University's supervisory charter and everyone sit around a table and work out what the story is. Who is doing what? Who is responsible for what? How is this going to function? What is the role of each supervisor? And are they both there throughout? Or are they working with you on different topics? So that alternative mode of supervision. Work out what model suits you. And you be really clear about your expectations and make sure they're really clear about their expectations. Don't put up with an administrative or paper supervisor. This is a waste, a waste of a supervisor's time. It's a waste of your time. You have an opportunity probably for the only time in your life to work with really bright people who care about you. So use that opportunity. And look, as you can hear I, in my voice, I'm often pretty underwhelmed by co or associate supervision because I've had some really bad experiences with co-supervisors where, and again, because I tend to deal with rescue supervisions, particularly after my return to Australia, you know, I've seen the worst of supervision and I've seen a whole series of supervisors add their name to my students so they get a pretty easy run because I know I see the students weekly, I read the work, I do the 10 drafts, so they just simply add their name and get themselves a completion. Am I angry about that? Yes, I am. And look, I do have problems with that situation, but what I would say is I've had great co-supervision as well. Uh, the best co-supervisor I ever worked with, and I know this will come as a surprise to you not, uh, was my late husband, Professor Steve Redhead. And remember, we had 30 plus completions before we met each other, before we supervised together. We tended to take on the rescue supervisions, the, the inverted commas, difficult students. They weren't difficult, by the way, but the difficult students that other people had walked away from, Steve and I took on. And it was such a great combination because we would both meet with the student weekly, we both read widely, we overlapped in our reading by about 60% so we could offer combined commentary but also the differences mattered. And because neither of us cared about workload, because in our last three jobs we weren't paid to supervise because we were paid to do other jobs, we simply did it for the benefit of the student, full stop. So you never heard phrases coming out of our mouth like, well I'm not being paid for this or it's not in my workload. None of the supervision was or is in the workload, so we did it for the students. Now I really haven't had that with anybody else. I think Justine, we've organised that well, I've got a very good feeling about that and she's an ethical, decent, extraordinary woman. But I have been pretty well underwhelmed by every other co-supervisor I've had because I tend to have the freeloaders. The freeloaders come on in and get themselves a completion and sort of throw peanuts from the peanut gallery and that's about it. So to stop that happening, obviously I have to deal with this myself too, to stop this happening, it's very important to have those expectations at the start. Know each of your supervisor's strengths 
and their weaknesses and don't expect your supervisor to be the messiah, your mother, your father, your brother, your boyfriend or your social worker. With two supervisors, know what they can do for you, know what they can't do for you and create some peace in that knowledge. Know that you may have to maintain independent relationships with each supervisor. I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but the nature of the overscheduled university at the moment with meetings and teaching and all the rest of it, the chances of getting you and the two academics in an office is probably nil. So again, make peace with that if that's not possible. So have the core meetings with your core supervisor and then swing in your alternative supervisor when it is possible and useful. So be clear in the expectations and keep everybody involved. Keep the conversations going. Remember, your supervisors may not get on. Academics are a weird sociological group. So your academic supervisors may not get on and look, that doesn't matter too much. In fact, it doesn't matter at all. They need to get on with you. The problem, which I still haven't resolved in my head, to be honest with you, is when supervisors offer contradictory advice. And that's the reason I'm still not completely sold on the co-supervisory model. Because if a student, if, if supervisors contradict each other and the students in the middle, what actually happens? Well, here's the resolution, really. How you handle this nightmare is that you remember that it is your thesis and all the supervision exists for. The only reason is to, su to support you to finish that research and finish that thesis. So you're a bright person. Take the advice that is meaningful to you, that is appropriate to you and your project and disregard the rest. Therefore, if a supervisor gets competitive or nasty or weird or abusive, that's not your concern. Take what is useful. Take the advice, ignore the emotion, ignore the stuff around it. And in that way, co-supervision becomes a portfolio of advice. And that is incredibly useful. I wish you love, light and peace. Tia.